Janet, you're on mute. Good morning. My name is Janet Frick, and I am with Salt Lake County Aging and Adult Services, the host agency for this year's Utah Elder Justice Conference. I want to welcome you to the session of Disappearing Self, Booming Onto Identity While Living with Dementia. As an attendee of this session, you will only be seeing the presenter and yourself. By clicking on the, the button on the lower right hand side of presenters. Please ask any questions you would like uh, through the Q&A on the bottom, also on the bottom right of the screen and questions will be addressed at the end of the session. I will now turn over the time to our presenter who will introduce themselves. Thank you for attending the session. Berta, it's the show, the presentation is now beginning for you. Thank you, Janet. And welcome to everybody joining us in WebEx land. Um, I'm glad for the opportunity to speak with all of you who give your time and your love to help those of us whose lives have become difficult because of natural aging, illness, or injury in the body or the brain. My name is Gerda Sanders, and I would like to thank my husband who's here with me. Um, his name is Peter, and he's my own 24-7 dementia caregiver, and my fixer and my lover, and my husband of 50 years. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Peter will now, Peter's going to run my PowerPoint because um, I'm unable to uh, do two things at once. And uh, to prevent me getting confused, he will work the camera and everything. And all I have to do is to read my presentation on paper and um, keep my place with my finger. Okay, so my share button is not active. Okay, and then uh, Olivia, just a reminder to take no, the I've, shared event. I've got it. Can you see it? Full screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. Um, 11 years ago, five days before my 61st birthday, I was given a diagnosis of microvascular di disease, the second cause of dementia after Alzheimer's. Next slide. My MRI showed that, as my rather blunt neurologist put it, I was already dementing. Since I was a published writer and taught English at the U for U of U for 20 years by then, it struck me as funny to learn the present participle of a word that I did not even know had a, had a word for. I demand, you demand, he, she, it demands. Now there's not a waking hour in which dementia as a word does not interfere with my activities. Let me give an example, an entry from my journal, which I'll call my field notes from three years ago. Peter stays in the car while I run in to buy oatmeal. Despite this being the same Smiths where I've shopped for more than 10 years, I can't locate the cereal aisle. After asking an employee, I stride up and down amid the fruit loops and raisin bran. No oats. After a while, I phone Peter. He finds me sulking by the Cheerios. Turn around, he says. There it is, behind my back, a cornucopia of oatmeal flavors and styles. I was so distracted by the many choices directly before my eyes, I had not thought to turn around. Executive function or working memory is the ability to pay attention that is holding in your mind the information to perform a multi-step task long enough to complete all the steps, while at the same time filtering out the distracting inputs and retaining only the relevant details. When I stay in my head, such as in writing, I can still focus because my eyes don't fall on the world outside the screen. However, when, when bombarded with tons of information in the grocery store or speaking here today, I need help to stay on track. 
Someone needing help with advancing PowerPoint probably still does fall short of the image that comes to most people's mind when they picture someone with dementia. My personal vision of this image is my mother, Susan Stienekamp, who became increasingly out of touch with reality from her early 70s until her death at 82. Despite excellent care, her hair was usually a must, her look vacant, her walk stumbling. She saw angels everywhere, announcing her every bodily function and poured water all over herself to, as she said, bring down my temperature. During my last visit to South Africa, my mother did not seem aware that I'd come halfway across the globe, but she did recognize me, if I take it as proof how she introduced me. And as you'll see on the screen, um, she said, this is my daughter who writes, and it's a word that rhymes with math. During my 50s, more than five years before my diagnosis, I started being bothered by short-term memory loss and getting lost in familiar places. I could still function in my work and family, but as I got close to 60, crazy incidents became obvious. The night before Easter, I prepared a casserole up to where it had to be baked. Next morning, with our children and grandkids already at the table, I opened the oven to get the dish out. It wasn't there. I found it in the fridge, still raw. I had a slow, sobbing meltdown. It was the first time my family saw me lose my cool over my memory loss. At work too, my deficits started to show. Once I became so anxious while teaching that a student fetched me some water. During a meeting that I chaired, my mind drifted while someone was speaking. I forgot what the meeting was about. When the meeting participants stopped talking, I desperately scanned my agenda. Let's introduce ourselves, I said. As the words left my mouth, I remembered with horror that we'd already gone around the table. When I tell stories like these, people often say, oh, I do that too, senior moments. I want to ask them how often this happens. Once a day, several times a day, several times an hour. Do you still drive? How weird are the mishaps you have? For example, take this entry from my field notes. At La Frontera, I was unable to interpret the beer stein the server put next to my corona light. I knew it was for beer, but couldn't absorb that it was upside down. I saw it as right side up with a tight fitting glass lid. I asked Peter how to get the lid off. He turned my mug around and slowly poured my drink in it from the bottle. By my 60th birthday, Peter and I talked about diagnosis. But why get me the medical opinions when there's ultimately no cure for the D word? This is why we decided to go for a diagnosis after all. If the unnameable did loom ahead, we could plan for diminished quality of life and expensive care. We discussed my symptoms with our family physicians. We told her that if I should prove to have dementia, I would plan a suicide for when my quality of life dropped too low. We made it clear we were not asking her help. She supported us following our own judgment. She went on to recommend an MRI a neurologist and a neuropsychologist. Since 2012, Radio West okay, has been making short films about, of how my family and I deal with my dementia. During our diagnostic quest, they accompanied us on a neuropsychological evaluation. Here is a video of our visit. This time I left out a kind of important chunk of the diagram that apparently I had managed to remember the previous times. I am very diminished in the mathematical component and I had a bachelor's degree in math and worked in the field for many years. So that is gone. This time was the first time that my, my score fell into a stage of dementia where the word dementia is actually part of the stage. I'm now officially in the fourth stage. 
it just goes downhill from there because there are seven stages and um, progressively you lose cognitive skills and uh, skills to perform daily activities. It's, it's an odd mixture of feelings. There's some feeling of relief that, okay, I'm really not making this up. Also, I've been talking and writing about my dementia. And because my language skills in writing are so good, I don't feel that, that I have really any credibility. I find it difficult to, to claim that I speak for people with dementia because I'm not in a place where, where when we see people, we think, oh, that person has dementia. It validates my sense that I am part of a community that I don't want to be part of, but also um, it strengthens my my desire to, to speak things that many people cannot bring themselves to say, and it puts an urgency on my sense that I have to, right now, since I have the opportunity to make these videos, that I have to do it, even though sometimes I, I just feel it's, it's a big stress. I really feel that that is something that in, in my life, where I've lost so many possibilities of goals that I could have in my retirement, where that is a remaining goal that I can stick to and still do for what I hope is a considerable time long. Many hundreds out of pocket dollars later, my neurologist determined that my MRI showed scattered white matter frontal lobe lesions caused by clogged microvessels that prevent blood and therefore oxygen from reaching surrounding brain areas. I had microvascular disease, a precursor of dementia. My neuropsychological tests confirmed a deterioration of my working memory. How they know this is that I'd lost 20 IQ points from when I was a young adult. In practice, it meant among other things that my shorter memory had become too bad to efficiently active and actively gather and retain information relevant to my environment. I did not quite realize how this loss was affecting me until a month or so after my diagnosis. Try driving without a working memory. Attempting to park one day, I crashed twice into the car park next to the space I was aiming for. That was the day I gave up driving, 11 years ago. Talk about a blow to my sense of self, never mind my independence. Early 60s and I could no longer drive. The yellow highlights show my current symptoms on this seven step chart, the global deterioration scale for the assessment of primary degenerative dementia. Despite the different mechanisms of injury in muscular, uh, microvascular dementia and Alzheimer's, their effects are so similar that they are both measured in this way. What effect does a dementia diagnosis have on one's sense of self? Contrary to what you might expect, my diagnosis brought Peter and me great relief. It confirmed that I still had the rationality to accurately observe that my life had become weird. Being right, however, did not mean that my sense of being out of sync with myself improved. Day by day, my damaged memory continues to wear down my old self. A self is the inner person that reliably shows up in your life every day. Our selves are created by the continuity, meaning and coherence that memory provides. When our memory fades, our self comes apart at the seams. You no longer act the way you and others expect. You no longer feel safe, competent and able to handle the world. Your familiar self is gone. You feel vulnerable all the time. Anxiety rules. Who is this faltering person taking my place? Where did my confident, capable self go? Who is this uncontrolled person having emotional outbursts 
and saying ungracious things to kind people in ways that would have repelled my former self. I felt as if an imposter self had taken over my old self. In the beginning, the imposter was just a bad feeling. Soon though, I thought of her as a separate identity. I named her Donya Kiyoli. I blamed her for my pathetic, illogical, or funny behavior. My name, Gada, Gada, stands for my old self. Some of the time, Gada is able to remain separate from the Donya. However, I am becoming more and more like her. Donya Kiyoli, nevertheless, helps a lot. I tell sad and funny stories about her. Peter, my family, our close friends, and anyone else who crosses my path join me in laughing at her exploits. Sometimes we cry. Dania Kiaudi gives me the opportunity to talk to other people about dementia. Almost everyone I talk to has someone in their circle who has dementia, and often they cannot talk deeply to each other about it. If only we could talk about dementia, it would help lift the shame, secrecy, and fear about the disease. Much of the stigma associated with dementia can be traced to our cultural image of the disease. In the words of Alzheimer researcher Patrick Fox, dementia conjures up images of a hideous, debilitating condition. Gerontologist Susan Benbow compares it with cancer, AIDS, and leprosy, since it commands fear before sympathy, because it is largely known through its most demeaning and despairing features. In writings about dementia, patients are often referred to as the living dead. On the day his father died, Jonathan Franzen noted that in the slow motion of Alzheimer's, my father wasn't much deader now than he had been two hours or two weeks or two months ago. The association between dementia patients and the living dead is often expressed via the word zombie. Researcher B Susan Biuniak observes that popular images of the zombie indeed capture the disheveled appearance, shuffling walk, obsessive wandering, lack of self-recognition, and failure to recognize others of, uh, of the late stage dementia. Dementia um, destroys several victim for, victims for every brain it infects. It cannibalizes spouses, children, family caretakers, friends. We could probably agree that the woman on the left like she looks like she might have dementia. She was Annie Naismith, a so-called so um, a former concert pianist trained at London's Royal Academy. After a so-called mental breakdown, she was unable to make music or manage her life. She lived in her car for 30 years. She died in 2015 after being struck by a bus. Robin Williams' dementia is a different story. Despite the plague of bewildering symptoms in his last two years of life, confusion, an impaired sense of smell, extreme anxiety, tremors, he still appeared normal in public. Despite his severe debilitation, noticeable to everyone on the set of what would be his last film, Night at, he completed Night at the Museum. Only after his suicide did his dementia become public. Although there is indeed much to fear from dementia, our cultural image does not tell the whole truth. While we fixate on the late stages of dementia, many people are now diagnosed with cognitive impairment long before they conform to the zombie image. Those of us, of those of us diagnosed with dementia symptoms that interfere with our lives, 50% has only mild cognitive impairment, 30% moderate, and only about 20% severe. Another skewing of our cultural image occurs because we often first encounter dementia in sufferers who are poor, homeless, not well educated, and lack medical insurance or family help. A Columbia University study attests that illiterate people are twice as likely to develop dementia as the well-educated. The opposite also holds true. We dementors who might seem fine at a cursory glance have in common a lifetime practicing a particular intellectual, artistic, or other skill. My studying four languages in high school, obtaining a bachelor's in chemistry, math, and physics, and a PhD in English, working in science for seven years, and teaching English for 20 years developed a large network of memory pathways. Even though many of my paths are broken, alternate routes route still work. In language tasks for which I prepare ahead of time, like today, I can still appear normal. Research shows, however, that we, the well-educated, eventually crash 50% faster than someone with a minimal education. 
According to his wife, Robin Williams went down like a 747 with no landing gear. A night at the museum seems had to be shot over and over because he had trouble remembering even one line. Whereas two years earlier, he played broad, two Broadway shows a day with hundreds of lines without mistakes. A 2019 visit to the University of Utah's Neurological Disorders and Imaging Clinic proved a new insight into the contrast between my relatively strong cognitive ability and my trouble with daily living. My MRO shows only a few additional lesions, not enough to explain my downturn. While my IQ score had gone down another handful of points, the drop was not low enough to explain my stage four and five symptoms. My doctor said that my condition had only deteriorated a little bit from 10 years ago. It was good news, they said. Why then was I having such a difficult time just living? The clinic visit was prompted by Peter and I noticing an acceleration in my downward slide. I got badly lost while walking routes I've traversed for years. My kids and friends also noticed. I changed topic in the middle of a sentence. I drift out of conversations without noticing. In the middle of going somewhere, I ask Peter where we're going. He tells me, the doctor, Starbucks, Grand Kid Night. A minute later, I ask again, again. My doctor's insistence that my dementia had not got, gone down as badly as we had experienced was very upsetting. We discussed the discrepancy with our daughter, Marissa, a data scientist. She analyzed my 14 page written neuropsychological report and prepared the results in visual form. In this way, they make perfect sense. Let's see if you agree. <clears throat> the University of Utah's clinic uh, uh, uses the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale number four to measure cognitive ability. The first figure explains the background on which Marissa plotted my scores. The only data related to me on this graph is the hexagon outlined in green inside the circle. The green dotted line indicates my average IQ score as an adult before dementia, shown as a percentile. The number 90 by the tip of the green arrow means my pre-dementia score for the category cognitive flexibility and problem solving was higher than 90% of the people taking the test and 10% of test takers scored higher than me. The black outlined figure represents the 50th percentile and is the average performance of the general population for each measured category. Similarly, the red arrow points to the 20th percentile. The red area represents mild to severe cognitive impairment. Here now in blue are my 2019 results on the background I just explained. The part of the blue figure that looks like a downward plunging bird with a pair of lopsided wings shows my results on the language functioning section. As you can see, the largest portion of my results, the blue wings, fall in the green or high functioning area. The tested categories are written on the outside of the green circle. For example, at the tip of the left wing, verbal comprehension. Next clockwise is phonemic naming. Yeah, yeah. phonemic naming. Um, the big dip between the wings into the red area is semantic naming or remembering words grouped into categories and so on around the rest of the green outline. This graph reflects the fact that I still demonstrate above average to superior performance in speaking and writing. The big dip at semantic naming um, explains why I can no longer remember things in groups, like the steps needed to make coffee or do my grooming. No wonder I fail at ordinary tasks around the house. The beige and the red parts of the circle show my visual, spatial and constructional functioning result. As you can see, the categories that make the head of the bird, the blue bird, that is between simple perception under the red arrow, and all the way to perceptual reasoning near the blue arrow, fall in the red impairment range. This explains why I'm so bird brain when trying to visually interpret my environment and perform tasks with me. This graph shows my results on attention, working memory, processing speed, and motor fun functioning. I don't blame you if you wonder where my results are, because they are that little distorted phone booth at the center. 
my scores all fall in the severely impaired range. These charts together show why I function well in verbal and written environment, but have endless failures in the activities of daily life. Although Peter and I, even before my diagnosis, spoken openly to our children and their families about my memory issues, after my diagnosis, we started a more deliberate discussion process that we call the Saunders Family Dementia Project. We asked everyone's input as we made our end of life plans. 35 years ago, Peter and I and our daughter Marissa, then seven years old, and son Newton, four, arrived in Salt Lake City from South Africa. Three and a half years later, decades later, our children are adults with spouses and children. Now we are nine Saunderses. When what is most important to me, interacting with the people I love is no longer possible. I want to die by a planned suicide for which I alone am responsible. No legal jeopardy to my family. My biggest fear is that I will miss the point where I can still perform all the actions for dying by myself. One day, the ca day you can, next day you can. With my family's help, I banish that fear. Via the Saunders Family Dementia, Dementia Project, we figured out a way for me to obtain a legal assisted death or a planned death that would not jeopardize my family when my quality of life drops too low. Together with our family, Peter and I brainstormed the following questions to each create our own advanced healthcare directives. What is a quality of life or degree of incapacitation each of us would find acceptable? What long-term care is available for dementia sufferers of mine, Peter's financial means? How do we feel about last-ditch uh, uh, life-extending efforts? And what would their financial and psychological consequences be? Under what conditions would each of us perform a planned suicide or seek an assisted death? How would each of us react to another's decision to end their life? Here's an expert from my advanced healthcare directors. A worthwhile life should include joy, acceptance, being with family, having the touch of others, being mentally aware and not becoming a burden to others. Death is as much a reality as birth, growth, maturity, and old age. We listed flags that would indicate when my quality of life is dwindling below acceptability. Do I spend more hours per day consuming care than just living on my own? Are my caretakers children or jobs or marriages or health or quality of life suffering? Do I still make a positive mark on the world, no matter how modest? For example, do I still receive pleasure by cuddling with a friend or a child or a grandchild? Is it a pleasure for them or am I inappropriate and scary? When enough of these flags are red, my family has agreed to support me in an assisted suicide. For someone with dementia though, a legal assisted suicide is not attainable in the United States. In states where assisted death is legal, only so-called people of sound mind can choose to die. Once you have a dementia diagnosis, you are legally no longer of sound mind. I cannot, for example, um, choose to participate in, um, in medication trials at my doctor's office as I had before, because now that I have a dementia diagnosis, I don't think that I have the judgment to be able to participate. Um, my wishes before I lose my reason do not count once I have lost my reason. So despite all my, uh, my, all my advanced healthcare directives, they will not be taken into account once I have a dementia. Accordingly, my family and I plan what we call a death trip to Europe. But because of COVID, and also because I would very much like to die in my own bed, we also planned various at-home options. To avoid putting my family in legal jeopardy, all activities geared to causing my death must be done by me alone. With my family's support, I will decide when the time is right. Should be, you be interested in more of our family discussions, you can find it on my website. At the start of our project, we had only one grandchild, Kanye then a toddler. He played around our project meetings, absorbing our dementia vocabulary as he did the words for our backyard raccoons or quail. So did the two grandkids who came later. We believe that if a child asks a question, they are ready for an honest answer appropriate to the age. The anecdotes I'm going to tell illustrate that although kids of different ages hear the same conversations, 
each only takes from them what they are ready to hear. When the Black Panther movie came out three years ago, my grandson Kanye, then 11 years old, and I saw it together. Near the end, a character, Killmonger, is mortally wounded when the hero thrusts a spear in his heart. The hero tells a dying man that they're going to save his life, but then they would have to keep him cap captive. Killmonger replies, I would rather die than live in bondage. He then pulls a spear from his chest in order to bleed to death. Afterwards, Kanye told me that I was a little bit like Killmonger because I also wanted to die rather than be imprisoned in my body. Three years ago, my granddaughter, Aliyah, who was then eight, entered a sculpture context with the theme, Everyday Heroes. A piece consists of a brain protected by two hands. It's titled, My Opa is My Hero, because he helps my Oma, who has dementia. My youngest grandson, Dante, then six, and I were playing at the back of our apartment by the river. I was a bad robot and he a good one. At one point, I stopped to look at the river running fast and wide after the rain and stopped walking like a robot. Focus, Oma, Dante said. I said, sorry, I forgot. He responded, I know. You have a disease in your brain, dementia. Your blood goes in your brain and damages it, so you forget. After discussing our plan with our doctor's financial advisor, tax lady and lawyer, Peter and I completed a, completed a financial plan, last will and testament, and advanced health care directives. As you'll see in the video to follow, our children and their spouses were with us when we signed the legal document five years ago. Before Peter shows you the video, I just want to tell you something more about our family. While Peter and I have always spoken openly to our children about everything from sex to death when they were growing up, our in-law children found our family dinner table talk rather disconcerting in the beginning. The one young woman will you see in the video in the turquoise sweater is my beloved daughter-in-law, Cheryl. When we first brought up the topic of, of assisted death uh, for Neil Peter um, at our dinner table, um, that was even before we started the Sanders Family, uh, Family Dementia Project, Cheryl was very upset. She um, got tears in her eyes and got up to leave and my son Newton went after her and comforted her and she did come back to the dinner table and we sort of, uh, you know, spoke about it and said we'd be more, you know, we'd, we'd ease her into these discussions more gently next time. A year or two into the Saunders Family Dementia Project, Cheryl's grandpa, with whom she was very close, died. By then, to satisfy extended family's desire that he live as long as possible, he had been fed through an abdominal feeding tube for over two years. Toward the end of his life, he suffered terribly, both physically and emotionally, for many months. When Cheryl and Newton visited, he begged God with almost every breath, take me, Lord, please take me. This is the background for what you'll hear Cheryl say about her grandpa's death in, uh, in the video. I like to think of the world and life as a use of energy. As long as you have the life power to, to keep on making order out of disorder, that is the function of life. And the minute physical life stops, everything about you will revert back to chaos. And that moment when you cease having the ability to make your mark in the world as a human, when that is gone, I really don't, I don't feel sadness for the body that is left. The Latin word for suicide is killing yourself. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, there's no point in, in arguing whether, you know, I'm killing myself or not. I am. Um, your mom has always asked you, she's asking you to do what you believe is moral, ethical, that you're comfortable doing. She's just trying to really express to you how she does want to live and how she doesn't want to live. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most powerful thing about it. I know what an impossible thing I'm asking. I want your feelings 
respected in this. And if one of these things are easier for you to do than another, I, I want you to keep that in consideration. I think that objects play a part in the continuity of lives. And this is the wonderful thing about vintage items and antique items. They are the objects that survived all the vicissitudes of life. There's a tea set that I bought for myself when I was a young mother and completely overwhelmed with maternal responsibilities. And we use that tea set all the time. And I want my daughter-in-law to have the tea set. I've, I've told this to my granddaughter, Aaliyah. She loves the tea set. She just loves drinking tea from it. So I've told her, you know, I'm going to give the tea set to your mom when I die. And maybe she'll give it to you when she dies. And Aaliyah is now torn between the ideas of wanting me to live forever, but wanting to get a hands on that tea set. But already she's, she's building the connection and she's learning to know the tea set in the context of loving me and loving her mom. And when her family uses it after I'm dead, it will be something that she already understands as something coming through the generations. But anyway, I, I want you guys to tell me where you are with us and what you're thinking. And... Well, I just want to say that um, after going through with my grandpa, standing over him and watching him die and suffer, I was like, it would be so easy for me to just take this pillow, you know, and, and be done because, yeah. you know, it was such a long and terrible thing. And so mm -hmm. I think me personally, after going through that, I think I could go and hit the morphine button for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it, it needs to be. If that's really what she wants, then I will do it and I will respect it. You are so mad. I think that how you see life and death and how you see the cycle of life and death, it influences your feeling toward death. And if you feel that death is just the most terrible thing that can happen to you and to your family, then I can see why you may want to postpone it to the very last minute of when your body will give in. But for me, there's great comfort in thinking about it as life and death, having a continuity, and because then my death is not just it's not a tragedy and it's not a catastrophe. It's absolutely part of a continuum of life that goes back to the beginning of the universe and will continue to the end of the universe. Let's keep it in the next paragraph. Okay. I, I just want... Um, I just want to say that I'm going to now uh, show you an image uh, that I want to tell you about. Our family recently received a request from Utah's PBS channel, that is channel seven, to combine the videos such as those you've seen that Radio West has made of us over the years into an hour long film which will be aired in Utah in January 22 and probably later be distributed nationwide. To shoot up-to-date post-COVID footage, Radio West has recently come, over, recently come over for two separate days of filming. One of the issues PBS is interested in is how I see my body related to my identity. As in a previous video, they wanted to film me coming out of the shower and getting dressed. The filming with Kelsey, the VRDP, videographer and Sally the producer was fun sort of like when I was at boarding school and we all hung around while someone dressed for a dance while I was still in my bra and Spanx we started talking about body and identity and I ended up doing the whole interview in my underwear Peter and I will have veto power on the phone but in principle it felt totally right to bear my soul with just a thin garment of Spanx between me and nakedness this story is intended to make you feel free to ask me any question at all. 
What can a person who poses in Spanx possibly still have left to hide? Please ask, because I have learned over my 71 years that the more you know, the better you are able to love. Thank you, Herbert. This is your 10 minute warning. I'm ready for questions if there are any. Thank you. Wonderful. I will read them as we get them, okay? Okay, thanks. Paula Gett would like to know if the video clips are available to watch again somewhere. Uh, you can find them um, if you Google my name and the word Radio West, which is the uh, organization uh, that, that, that makes them. You, they are all available on, um, on Vimeo or on Radio West's website. You can also find them on my website, which is just my name, uh, gadasaunders.com. There are six videos so far. Another question is, through your diagnostic process, what has been the most helpful things your medical providers have done? And are there any things you wish they had handled differently? I really was, um, I was very fortunate in the whole diagnostic process. My first neurologist um, sort of had no bedside manner. She was very straightforward. And, um, and even though, in some sense, it was off-putting. I, I really appreciated her eventually. Uh, the only thing with her was is that she could only uh, she could only really uh, deal with one-word answers. And as you will see from what I've just been saying, I am not a one-word answer person. And so um, I actually we discussed it with her, and I said that if I uh, need to work with you, then you have to be able to let me answer my questions in my own way. And that has been uh, the, the one person, but then in general, I think that, um, that I still think that some of the uh, understanding that I've gained over the uh, period of having dementia has not worked through to everyone in the medical profession. For example, the, the doctors at the university medical clinic, they are amazing doctors and I've got amazing information from them, but the way that they averaged out my results and, and because my average is still high, said that I was only, should only have slight problems living with dementia. I think that is something that has not um, pervaded the medical establishment because whenever I have shown these uh, graphs, at conferences, to, to nurses, to medical students, to doctors, they have been astounded at how a, a general score is so different from when you look at the detail of where the impairments are. But other than that, I have um, all of our doctors have been able to talk about any awkward question that we may have wanted to ask, including ask the questions about quality of life and um, and so on. So. Um, so I, I don't know. I just think what I can tell people going through the process is to be absolutely honest. Say what you think, and uh, and also insist that the doctors need to be able to have that dis those discussions with you, um, unless you'd have to find someone else to work. Thank you. And this is just our five minute warning. So okay. if you have any questions, get them in.
I would like just to add to to your presentation. What a remarkable life path you're living. Well, well, thank you, Janet. If I may say that I have been incredibly fortunate in my life. Um, I come from a, a poor family in South Africa on a farm, and the opportunities I had was largely as a result of uh, racial discrimination because because I was a white person. I had lots of advantages that my fellow uh, black uh, farm lived people who lived with us on the farm did not have. And I've been incredibly fortunate in my life. And I feel that that is, um, I also am incredibly fortunate in having a, a very understanding family. And so that is, I just want to say that I acknowledge all the way um, how lucky I am. And I am very grateful that I have the support to enjoy, I, th they are, not a day in my life where they're not very that I does not have very enjoyable parts in it. Sundays are hard, but even they have had very enjoyable parts up to now. So I want to just acknowledge that and thank you to my husband Peter and my family for that and, and the medical community. Every all my doctors have been absolutely amazing. Thank you. I know that was Kelly Romer, one of our participants, um, just wants to thank you for sharing your story. Well, thank you so much. It's it's my honor um, and my privilege to be able to talk, as you saw on that craft, because my language wings are still flying. I can still do it. Uh, but I appreciate you listening and I appreciate everybody who's attending today or people who who care for people like me and for even though uh, older people, even though um, everyone does not have dementia, just growing older has many of the characteristics that you experience as someone with dementia in that you become invisible, people think you don't have an opinion anymore. And you are the people who are logged in today who care for those of us uh, who, who have whose lives have become difficult in different ways. And I thank you for it. Well, we have reached the end of our session of, for the Utah Elder Justice Conference, and I want to thank you for attending The Disappearing Self, Glooming on My Identity While Living with Dementia. We hope you enjoy the rest of our session. We have a, uh, a lunch break uh, preceding this uh, presentation, and we return at 1.30. So thank you again. Um, for sharing your time and knowledge and for attending the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>